I go aboard my immigrant ship to see what Latter-day Saints were like. It would be difficult to find 800 people together anywhere else and find so much beauty and so much strength and capacity for work among them. These people are all so cheery. Nobody is in an ill temper. Nobody is the worse for drink. Nobody swears an oath or uses a coarse word. They were in their degree the pick and flower of England. I went on board this ship to bear testimony against them. To my great astonishment, they did not deserve it. And my predispositions must not affect me as an honest witness. Some remarkable influence had produced a remarkable result. Recognizing the remarkable in these British converts, Charles Dickens overthrew his own early prejudices about them, feeling their collective worth impossible to deny. He referred to them as, as looking like they were the pick and flower of England. So this was a powerful voice to dispel the more general characterization of, of Mormon converts as just the low-life riffraff offcasts of society. These people were actually members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but most were calling them Mormons because of their belief in the Book of Mormon. To them, a sacred record which complements the Bible as a testament of Jesus Christ. Missionaries had begun arriving in England in 1837, and it didn't take long for individuals and even entire congregations to begin converting. In the Chapman and Downham area, you know, 110 people join in five days. Uh, you'd have people like Reverend Fielding in Preston, uh, Reverend uh, Richards in Walkerfold, who welcomed them in. Soon, converts in those early days began immigrating to America, where the church headquarters were located, to settle among like-minded saints. The church here was larger than it was in the States, um, but the, the call was to emigrate. Um, that's what people wanted to do. They wanted to be with the saints. They wanted to build up Zion over there, and so they would leave. Entire ships were being chartered, and before the end of the century, over 85,000 converts to this faith had departed their European homelands and sailed to America. Their organized migrations across the Atlantic became a hallmark for safety and order among shipping lines, and ship captains became envious of this cargo. Anxiety against the new religion grew, however, as some members of this faith began practicing polygamy in America. As soon as it became known that polygamy was now part of the picture, then all kinds of stories, it was just ripe for exaggeration. Prominent authors and upstarts began fueling the fires with tales of lust, greed, and calculated control over unsuspecting villagers. Arthur Conan Doyle's study in Scarlet was one of the most widely read. He was certainly the most renowned author who chose Mormonism as a particular target, was primarily uh, preoccupied with both polygamy as a theme and with the motif of the avenging angels. Winifred Graham describes the mesmeric powers of the missionaries, their ability to hypnotize simply with their gaze. In actual fact, there were over 200 novels that were devoted to the Mormon theme in literature. People became so convinced by the portrayals in these novels that physical skirmishes arose between Brits and Mormons in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So that moral fervor lent itself to the mood of the times in terms of views of, of Mormons as, as a moral scourge uh, who needed to be extirpated. And there were like thousands of people who would turn up in the street to protest against the Mormon presence. This wasn't just an academic uh, objection. There, were, there was real violence involved. Soon, films based upon these novels played to pack theatres, adding to the fray. British Mission President Rudger Clawson, eager to prevent violence similar to what he had experienced years earlier when a misguided mob killed his own missionary companion in America, sent missionaries to theatres with flyers to educate filmgoers on the actual activities of missionaries. He also offered a reward for anyone who could present evidence that would substantiate the claims that were being made. The £200 reward went unclaimed, but whether the depictions were true or not did not really matter. The idea had lodged in many minds that this church was evil, and it seemed nothing could convince them otherwise. With the outbreak of World War I, Latter-day Saint missionaries were recalled to America. But when the war was over and missionaries returned, an extensive cleanup effort was initiated throughout Britain, not only for the ashes of a world war, but from the war on Mormons as well, the latter cleanup requiring decades to accomplish. It always comes with a myth 
oh, the Mormons, don't you have three wives? Or, oh, the Mormons, uh, you know, don't they have a, like a racial issue thing? Or, oh, the Mormons, you know, are they like really weird and do they have horns? All of these old, old preconceptions, you know, church had a tunnel from Liverpool to Salt Lake where it would steal women and take them back. Uh, I remember as a young missionary, uh, someone uh, called me a devil. Being a missionary was difficult enough and going door to door did not help. I thought that Latter-day Saints were a bit odd. I'd see the missionaries in the streets and try my best to avoid them. Now, neighbor told me, that's the Mormons. Wow. And I thought, OK, then, if I see them coming, I won't answer the door. A knock on the doorstep, on the front door, is much more likely to be somebody like me, a politician, seeking a vote. And that's very unwelcome that the householder runs to the back of the kitchen and hopes the politician will go away. Being perceived negatively was indeed a hindrance, so the challenge was how to get to know these church members without being threatened by them. I'd knock on the door. I'd say, hi, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, we'd love to come in. And say, no, no, not interested. I said, well, can I sing you a song? You want to sing me a song? I said, go on then. So, <laughs> so I'd sing a song. Probably about 35, 45% we'd get in the doors. Music does have a way of opening doors. In the summer of 1955, the world-renowned Mormon Tabernacle Choir, whose founding members were immigrants from Wales, toured Great Britain, packing halls in Glasgow, Manchester, Cardiff, and London. The choir has definitely been a huge thing in shaping the face of Europe. We, you, I mean, especially amongst the older generation, you always hear them say, you know, switch over the channel. I, I don't know who they are. I, I don't know what church they belong to, but I switch on and I watch the music and the spoken word religiously. They're not members of the church, but they watch it because it uplifts them. I think there's no question that the Tabernacle Choir has been the most effective ambassador that the church has had through the decades. The choir was actually in Britain to sing at the groundbreaking for the first British temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This temple meant that the highest rituals of their faith could now be obtained right here on British soil. It meant that Zion could be in the United Kingdom. People would go to America to have the ordinances performed in the temple. Now they could have them performed in their own land. In 1958, the London Temple opened with a public open house, and over 76,000 people toured its halls. Thereafter, the stately edifice was dedicated to God and became a sacred house of the Lord. In 1959, Latter-day Saint missionaries began sharing their sports skills with British youth. We'd start playing baseball. Kids would come and want to play, and so we taught them how to play baseball. Then we wrote down their names and their addresses so that we could go and meet their parents and get permission for them to play. They gave me a form to fill out, which uh, was filled out. And my mum did say, this is a bit strange, son, you know. I said, sorry, mum, it's only to play baseball. So she signed the form. The form gave permission for the young men to be baptised. But some missionaries became overly aggressive in this endeavor, and criticism naturally followed. But for many youth, it was a life-changing event. Those young people that joined the church, perhaps not even knowing what they were doing, but they felt differently about Mormons. They felt differently about the gospel and the church. I set my mission in uh, Bristol. Um, when I came back and I got married, um, my two, two of my daughters have served missions. In 1955, a bombed-out parcel of London's South Kensington district had been purchased to accommodate a large meeting house. By the summer of 1961, the Hyde Park Chapel had become a reality. We would arrange guest speakers to come, people such as Billy Casper and folks like that, and organ recitals from accomplished musicians. And so the Hyde Park Chapel became a place that missionaries would bring their contacts so they could see a bigger view of the church. The Seminary and Institutes of Religion programs for the youth came to England in 1968, which included early morning religion classes for high school and university age students. They would make huge sacrifices to get to the class. They just seemed to be empowered by the idea of something that was there for them, especially for them, to help them grow and develop in the church. Once seminary starts, 
then kids start going on missions. Then they come home prepared to be leaders. And, and they have families, and they're married in the temple, and, and they become successful. In the spring of 1969, public perceptions about the church improved when a young Latter-day Saint missionary was featured on a 30-minute program that was televised across the UK. They played the Battle Hymn of Republic by the Tabernacle Choir. And so when that finished, the fellow said, isn't that wonderful? What a terrific choir these people have. I've been to Salt Lake. They're wonderful. Mormons are great. But, he said, we have tonight with us a real Mormon missionary. Elder Wright, welcome to the show. The program went well, with Elder Wright answering many important questions as best he could. Then the tougher questions came. Are you a polygamist? And of course they said, no, yada, you know, and they, he explained, and we just talked about it. And he said, well, why do you practice polygamy? I said, it's just very simple. A prophet of God, which we've talked about, commanded us to live polygamy for a short period of time in our history for specific purposes related to, you know, membership growth. And I said it was successful, and when the purpose was ended, the revelation was withdrawn, and we are no longer polygamous. And so then he said, all right, he said, hasn't this been wonderful? He said, the next time these guys come, let them in. He said, they're great guys. Prejudices were being softened, but within three years, British youth were again screaming at Latter-day Saints, this time to a different tune. Oh, oh, oh. Osmonds had become a pop phenomenon. Their 11 gold records in a one-year period shattered the Beatles' best 12-month total. The following year, the family registered 13 additional hits, and Osmond mania was in full swing. Crazy. When the Osmonds arrived at Heathrow in 1973, an unexpected number of fans were there to greet them. You know, the pilot said back to us, is there some people, a lot of people at the airport? The exact number, I'm not sure, but literally thousands of screaming fans. And we had just stepped off our plane, and I said, something just happened. And we looked over, and you could see that the balcony was missing. This one balcony couldn't handle uh, all of those fans on it, and it collapsed. We had to get out of the, the airport as fast as possible so it would dissipate. It was crazy, and uh, we were banned from Heathrow. Osman concerts were sold-out events, with fans screaming through entire performances. They just had a fantastic sound. They sounded so good together, the harmonies. and um, But there was something else behind those white smiles and the jumpsuits. I was really fascinated by their lifestyle. They were very open with what they believed, um, didn't hold back anything. They were very upfront and held to those standards, and that impressed me. And then I found out that they were members of this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I thought, huh. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We told them why, that we were LDS, and we, uh, here we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't mess around, and we just, when we get married, we get for good. And the girls like that. As Osmonds were making daily headlines, news outlets raised skepticism of their goodness. The press were not kind to us. They, they tried to pick us apart, talked a lot about us being plastic. I was watching television. The topic, is Donny Osmond healthy for the British young teenager? Should we deport Donny Osmond? <laughs> the BBC printed on the front of the page of the newspaper, Osmonds go home. The Osmonds managed to get by with a little help from their friends. Paul McCartney defended us against the press. And there's a knock on the door, and I open it up, it's Paul McCartney standing there with his daughter Mary. And the legend, our hero, but more importantly, it was Paul McCartney, the father. He brought his little daughter to get Donnie's autograph. He says, uh, can I get your autograph, please, for my daughter? And uh, I said, yeah. And he hands me a picture of me. He says, put it to Mary, please. So I put to Mary, love, Donny Osmond. Gave it to Paul. He gave it to Mary. She was all excited. We had the nicest talk, and that's when I realized that we were respected. He said he loved what we stood for, and that's where the press started to say, oh, my goodness, 
What are you going to say about Sir McCartney? Through it all, fan support for the Osmonds never wavered, and fans clamoured for more and more material about them. The people of England really noticed that example that they set, and I think that's the reason they wanted to be like the Osmonds. I look back and I see that that was one of the really solid impacts that we had for the church was to bear a testimony when we had that opportunity too. I didn't even know that there was a God, but there was something that struck a chord in me about the Osmonds when they talked about Heavenly Father and they talked about certain things that just, just resonated. I didn't know what was I was feeling. I, it just felt like magic was being sprinkled over me, that I just had this feeling that I'm in a good place. We took carton after carton after carton of Book of Mormons and we never brought one home. And they autographed them to make sure that whoever they gave them to would keep them because their signatures were in the front cover. They kept talking about this Book of Mormon and I wanted to get my hands on one of those books and read it. I will never forget the night I got on my knees after reading it. It changed my life because you can rationalize anything away, but you can't rationalize away what you feel. And uh, it didn't matter how hard it was to live. I knew it was true. While Donnie was influential in what I learned, what I attracted me to the church, that wasn't the reason I got baptized. I got baptized because I gained a testimony. What the Osmonds accomplished by living their religion in such a vocal way was to shed light on the Latter-day Saint lifestyle. Just as Dickens' first-hand observation of passengers on the Amazon had changed his viewpoint, so the Osmonds changed perspectives for countless others. I think it changed the whole idea and the old vision of what Latter-day Saints faith was about. And they put them on a new pedestal within people. They recognised these are normal, everyday Guys. This family not only spoke about what they believed, but they lived it, and it was their happiness. It was the smile. It, it, there was something in their eyes. There was something in their personality that people found contagious. With the Osman popularity, members of their faith across the UK became more visible themselves. When the members see the church portrayed in a very positive light, when they see their own stories being told with accuracy and with truth, then their confidence is built. We felt proud that we would have British missionaries walking along the streets, giving the image that this was no longer an American church, but a local church with its own leadership, with its own missionaries, British talking to British. In 1990, Latter-day Saint church member Terry Rooney was elected as a member of parliament. He was the first Latter-day Saint to receive such a position in Britain, but others would shortly follow. Two or three LDS people have managed to get themselves elected to the House of Commons, so I've now got some new mates there as well. I invited Elder Holland to come to the House of Lords. That was a terrifically good day. It was a real breakthrough. Certainly, I don't think any other LDS eminence had ever addressed the House of Lords before. It was a wonderful privilege to, uh, to have apostolic presence and participation. And since then, we've managed this a number of times, addressing all party parliamentary groups. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has become a great benefit to communities throughout Britain through their insatiable appetite for service. The charitable work that LDS members and the church does itself is just fantastic. And I've seen it on the ground, and it's exactly what it ought to be. And in today's world, that's surprisingly rare. We have a position in the government called Secretary of State for International Development. Right? That's basically aid. And he said to me, your church is always the first one there and the only one that's not waiting for the TV cameras. The church goes out and they've got the yellow shirts and vests and they go out where all the tragedies are and they go and serve and bless the people. And I think that's huge. You know, it's always going to be about service. They do this, but they don't tell people they've been part of it. So I want to sing the praises because they do do it. They come along and they get on with doing good work, but they are shy of telling people. So I always say, overcome that shyness, let's tell people. With continued growth, 
a second major temple became necessary in northern England. Well, when the temple was announced, there was a lot of concern because of ignorance. Ignorance in terms of not many people understood what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was really about. I was on the council and I said, Luke, you know, there's a meeting between uh, the Mormon church, as it was described, wanting to sit down to develop a piece of land on a very important part of Chorley. And I've got to say, I, I was worse than sceptical. I was rather annoyed. The solitary hand went up at the back. He stood up and he said, I have visited one of your temple sites. He didn't say which one, but the grounds were just beautiful. The quality was first class and it was absolutely wonderful. And then without prompting, he pointed to his neighbors and said, look, this will be the best neighbor that you will ever have and you should vote for it. The spirit was very strong and at the end of the night, permission was granted and uh, it, some of the councillors didn't actually know why they voted for it. They were, they were in shock, but we knew uh, it, it was extraordinary. It was, it was very powerful. The Preston Temple was built in Chorley, prominently overlooking the M61 motorway, and a public open house provided tours for over 120,000 interested guests prior to its dedication. And it was one of the greatest openings that we've ever seen. The numbers that went through were fantastic. This was something so beautiful. And it was a moving experience that will be with me for the rest of my life. As part of the campus of the Preston Temple, there is a wonderful family history center included. Here, people of any faith or persuasion can research their ancestors and trace their family roots. Uh, hundreds of people come to the family history center. We have church members that assist them, find their, their, their relatives and their the family history, uh, they regularly use it. There are over a hundred such family history centres throughout the UK and Ireland. It's always been open to, to the public and many local uh, people within the community here in Cardiff have used that facility and uh, been able to find a lot of their ancestors. Wales, yeah. England, Wales. Yeah. In the early 21st century, British Latter-day Saints further opened hearts and minds when they celebrated their own Christian heritage through dramatic pageants. These exceptional enactments performed near the Preston Temple utilized the contributed talents of several hundred participants as they chronicled the history of their faith in Britain. Well, they put on some great productions, the history of the faith, the fact that the story is being told a few times when these great productions are put on at Chorley. The first pageant we had was very well taken. Uh, the, the members and people that were invited, local businessmen, local people, they came, quite a lot came. It exudes the spirit. It tells the true story and the tales of, of saints who had gone through so much. It just moved me. Um, I, I just, it was very professionally done but it hit a core, it hit a nerve in, I guess, my spiritual heritage, having seen what my parents had done as pioneers for our family. It was something that hit home way more because, the, you know, a lot of the Brits were like, we were part of this. With the 9-11 attacks in America and the 7-7 bombings in London, faith groups across Britain came together to facilitate healing and understanding. Now, you know, we're invited to be active participants in interfaith, and the results of it have been spectacular, not just for us, but for everybody. Whenever you come across a different faith community, whether that be Latter-day Saints or anyone else, you become a little bit more than what you used to be. We have young people go on missions, and they learn incredible skills about, about how to interact with society. But when you put those skills into other communities, people sit back and think, goodness me, these people know how to, how to administer things, they know how to you know, organize themselves, and they know how to get things done. We build uh, these relationships with opinion leaders and really good people who, who, are, who, are, who are busy in society doing good, and, and we're playing in those circles now. I work with the leaders of all um, faiths, and we go to government meetings to be able to um, either uphold or to be able to put forward laws um, that need to happen and to develop relationships with them. It's been great having the, you know, the, 
uh, Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints as members, as members of Interfaith Scotland and doing interfaith work at that national level. With all the good the Latter-day Saints are doing in the UK, there are still those who desire to put them down. The Book of Mormon musical is one such example. Here's this profanity-laced musical that kind of makes fun of missionaries, but handled the right way. It raised the public profile and enabled us to, to drive our own message. We were able to engage in a, a major media outreach. The church is advertised in the, in the playbill, the profile of the church in the media now is significantly higher. I think the Mormon church and the LDS leadership is to be credited for their mature response, which was to exploit a bad situation to their own ends by such advertising slogans as you've seen the play, now read the book. It was positive, it was, it was brash and bold, um, but the name is out there with a big red heart. Well, I had my face on the buses, I had my face on the, on the underground and stuff like that. And so I saw it and I saw the response from my friends, from my family, and they were saying, this is, this is really cool what your, what your church is doing. After over a century and a half of contact with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Britain, one outcome rises unmistakably above the others. These people are resilient. Indeed, as Charles Dickens said, it would be difficult to find 800 people together anywhere else and find so much beauty and strength. My initial friendships have brought some wonderful people uh, from Salt Lake City to London, to Westminster, uh, and even down to my sister's homes in Berkshire. I always try to talk to missionaries if I see them in Oxford and always will say uh, they were talking to somebody else at the time and I just waved and, and, and I said to her, if you're interested in family and stability, uh, then listen to these guys. If I were to evaluate religions and not just whole religions but religious subgroups and so on by the effect that those religions have on the lives of the people who practice them then I can think of no other religious group which has a more positive effect on the lives of the people who practice it than Mormonism. Everyone I have met in the senior leadership of the Church of Latter-day Saints has been uh, promoting the importance of love of neighbor um, and even love of enemy, actually. And that's something that I hugely respect and admire about the church, and that uh, the church has this strong ministry of reaching beyond its borders. It's an outward-facing church. It's not an inward-looking church. And that is something that all of us can learn from. A stranger would be puzzled to guess the right name for these people. Indeed he would. If you hadn't known, could you ever have supposed? How could I? I should have said they were, in their degree, the pick and flower of England. So should I, 